So for a lot of people, it's watch what you wish for. For me, totally different. I'm 18 or almost 18. I like to call myself 18 because I'm heading out to school. I'm on the front lawn, New Jersey, small town, right by the Jersey Shore. My mom's got her arms wrapped around me and she's not letting go. The car is all packed up. I want to get out of here. It's time for me to transition to my next life. You remember what that's like. Can't wait to leave. As a matter of fact, it was the summertime. I wasn't even waiting to get out of the house. My dad comes out of the door and he puts his arms around me and he says, don't forget what we talked about. I said, Pops, I'm going off to school. Please, leave me alone. I'm only 18. He goes, you're not 18. I'm only 18. Pensions, good salary. I know what he's talking about. Teaching. <clears throat> I said, Daddy, you know what I want. I've told you my whole life I am going to be an actress. That's what my whole life is going to be about. He goes, Robin, just in case. Teaching, steady salary. A paycheck you can count on, and a pension. <laughs> I said, I'm too... Okay, I'm out of here, Daddy. Love you. I wrap my arms around him. I wrap my arms around my mom. I am out. Now, I'm going to Antioch College, and if any of you remember what that was like in the early 70s, it was quite a wild place. So I figured that I was heading exactly where I needed to go. Now. When I had applied, I found out that Antioch had a big Shakespeare program. And they had a lot of theater. And that's what I was looking for. You see, I had a plan for my life. I was going to be an important actress, in important plays, on important stages, doing important new and important old work. The key word here was important. <laughs> I knew from the very beginning who I was. But when I got to Antioch, there was none of that. So there I am, miles. I mean, Antioch's in Ohio. I live on the Jersey Shore. What am I going to do? I don't know where to go. But it didn't really matter. It was the 1970s, and there was a lot of other things going on that took up a lot of space. Uh, I don't think I have to elucidate it for this crowd, but in case you forgot, <laughs> drugs, sex, and rock and roll. <laughs> oh, and the other thing was, in case you forgot, the Vietnam War, the rise of feminism, gay pride. It was the end of the civil rights movement as we knew it. It was had moved into black power. And I found myself surrounded in a way that I'd never been surrounded by people who actually talked about these things. And I found that I did it was like I did 360 again and again and again until I turned 180 from where I had started. <clears throat> so my great plan to be a famous, important, notable actress doing, as you know, notable, important, exciting, new, old work had changed. Because I knew that there had to be a way to stick my two passions together. I wanted to be involved in politics. The women's movement actually shifted everything inside me. But I also wanted to do theater. Luckily for me, there was a green room at Antioch, even though there was no theater. And on the wall of the green room was a little post-it, or the equivalent of what it would be. And it said, if you want to do important, meaningful work, as a theater artist working with others, oh, I just love all of this, um, give this, this number a call. And I called. There was a woman visiting Antioch, visiting her friend. She was from Chicago. And she was part of a group called Rapid Transit Guerrilla Communications. Street theater. That was for me. I packed up and I left. I went to Chicago. Oh, and somewhere in there I called my parents and I said, guess what, folks? 
I'm going to do you a favor. I'm saving you money. I just withdrew from school. Okay, they took it very well. Nobody said anything. Except my dad did that little whisper. Ah, oh, and when you go back, remember, teaching, pensions, salary. I said, Daddy, that's backwards. It doesn't matter. You always want to plan ahead. Well, he said that, but, you know, within no time at all, I was completely involved in all the work that was happening in Chicago. I was involved in the street theater that had, had to do with Vietnam. I had to, was involved in a women's street theater. I was involved in, in like Puerto Rican, Latino, Mexican theater. I was involved in black theater. I was the person who represented everybody. I went to demonstrations. I, I wrote, I drew, I created costumes, I acted, I directed, I built sets. I considered myself very important. And I made sure everybody else around me did too. I was doing important work. And I was doing, writing important things with other important people. And you know, all silliness aside, it was good work. And it did inform everything I am today in a way that I, I'm a good Jewish girl, you don't do these things. But there I was. It was only one problem. And I'm sure you guys can figure that out, all these artists here. No money. <coughs> so what am I supposed to do? I'm, I'm real important and I'm broke. I can't call my folks and say, hey, mom and dad, I have to get a straight job. <laughs> so I got a straight job. And you know what the straight job for actors is? Waitress. Waitress. <laughs> I started out in a diner. I had a really bad experience because I went in there as the little hippie I had become in 1970. I didn't shave my legs. I didn't shower. I didn't shave under my arms. I was told to use deodorant. Um, I moved on after that to businessmen's lunch. And I moved on after that to bars and then I moved back to businessmen's lunches and all along the way people kept trying to promote me. By now I was shaving and showering and using deodorant. Um, so I guess I was presentable but they figured out early on that I had something to offer and I should probably be in charge of something. Meanwhile I was the person totally behind their backs teaching the younger waitresses how to steal. But that was another thing. That was part of taking from the man. So I was able to work both my jobs, my waitress job, in with my theater work, and I could go back and then turn it into a play. After a while, if you've been a waitress or a waiter, it takes energy. It takes the kind of energy that sort of pulls it out of you and doesn't give back. So I had to figure out what was next. I didn't know what it was. I kept getting these calls from my dad saying, teaching. I kept saying, no. He kept saying, salary. I said, who cares? And I was really dead set against it. I, I basically, I told him I was just not going to be one of those drones who go in and show up and work with kids and is, are really boring and, you know, and dress in those kind of weird, straight-looking clothes, and um, I had more to offer to the world, you know, as an artist. And he just kept saying, I said, go away. And we had that kind of relationship where he didn't really go away, but I thought he did. Well, I had, like I said, gotten to this place where I didn't know how I was going to make money and feel okay about myself. Because I was exhausted from waitressing. At one point, I was waitressing full time, going to school in theater full time. I was acting in a theater company full time, and I was playing flute in a Latin band full time. <laughs> I was 21. I could do everything. I think I was sleeping three hours. I had a full time relationship also uh, with two guys, but that was another thing. So. 
there I am, trying to figure out what to do, and I'm, I'm sharing an apartment with my friend Jenny. Now, Jenny Boyle, she is a Chicago Irish girl. She lived on the south side of Chicago, which is totally different than the north side. The south side is where all the Chicago people live, and the north side is where all the hip, cool people were living then. I, of course, we were living on the north side. But Jenny was from the south side, and she knew Chicago. And one day she walked up to me and she goes, you know, Robin, I figured out the solution. She was very smart. She always knew how to get around things. She goes, I know what your solution is. And she handed me something, like a little thing out of the newspaper. Remember when you used to get jobs by looking in the newspaper? In the want, help wanted edge? <laughs> she goes, here, take this. And I say, it's a boys club. What's this have to do with me? She goes, I know these people. Look, I've got an idea. They need somebody to teach, well, I mean, to offer classes, not workshops in arts and crafts and woodshop. Uh, why don't you take the job? I know these people. I am sure you can do this. I said, Jenny, it's teaching. I hate teaching. I hate teachers. I hate being a teacher. I don't even know if I like kids. She goes, you like kids? You'll be great. Do what I tell you. I'll go to the library. We'll get the books. Uh, Johnny Boy, we had a friend, Johnny Boy Gonzalez. Johnny Boy will show you how to work with the machines in the wood shop. Don't worry. And, and I'll write a resume. So she made up a resume out of thin air. And, and I got the job. My first day I show up. And that's when I realize I have to teach two classes at the same time wood shop with these big old machines and arts and crafts. I don't know how I did it, but I spent an entire summer running back and forth. And I got it. It actually was really easy. And I didn't think I was teaching. I was just pushing things at kids and saying, why don't you do this? Careful, don't go and staple yourself. Okay, good, nice, nice. Yeah, can we clean up now? And, and that's what it was like. And nobody lost a, a finger and nobody was stapled to the wall. So I figured I'd been successful. But now what do I do? The summer's over, damn it, they offer me a full-time job. I couldn't believe it. Here I am again, getting offered a job to do something I had said I wasn't gonna do. Like it was okay for the summer because it was just workshops. <laughs> if it was during the year, I'd have to teach. Luckily for me, my friend Jenny is always on top of things. Jenny came up with another one of those little pieces of paper that she had ripped out of the newspaper. This was from the Jane Addams Hull House. So you guys have heard of Jane Addams, right? A woman who started all the settlement houses, right? This kind of appealed to me. Settlement house, mm, I like that better than the boys club. Settlement house, okay. Jane Adams. But then I look at what I have to do. I have to be a group leader for like kids who are nine to 12. I have no idea how you deal with nine to 12 years old. It's close up, like face to face. I'm thinking, what am I gonna do? I can't do this. Ginny goes, don't worry about it. I'll write up your resume again. You now have something that's real. They liked you. And let's see what happens. So you may have picked up that I always did what Jenny said. <laughs> um, and so I did. And I got the job. You know, it's really been the story of my life that I find myself thrust into things that I've not prepared. I started waitressing that way. I started acting that way. I started writing, I mean, everything. And here I am group leading that way. But I don't know, people started helping me. I learned how to ask for help from the people there. And my very weird boss kept telling me, nice work, Robin, you're really getting it. I'm thinking, what are you talking about? <laughs> but there was this one day where it had been raining, and Chicago, of course, in April, is very rainy. And I laid out these mats. And the kids that I worked with, they were from all over the world. 
that's what I sort of had come to like about the center. There, you know, I had never, I knew black people, I knew Puerto Rican and Mexican people, and I knew Jewish people, and I knew Christian. And all of a sudden I discovered Caribbean, Belize, different parts of South America, Africa, I mean, this was kind of wild. <coughs> well, this little girl, this little boy, Roberto, uh, and I laid the mat down, he was lying near me. And I was sitting there for a while. And then I got up to visit all the kids and make sure everybody was cool. They, they'd taken food or, or toys or books, and they were just relaxing. And Roberto looks over at me and goes, hey, Miss Robin. I love it when they call you Miss. Miss Robin, uh, will you read to me? I say, well, I don't know. I don't really like reading out loud. He goes, oh, I got a better idea. Tell me a story. And I think, I don't know any stories. He goes, oh, you can do it. He knew by now that I was an actress, because all the time I was doing this, of course, I hadn't stopped acting. I was, wasn't going to school full-time, but I was still acting full-time and taking classes full-time, as well as teaching full-time and playing in a band full-time and had two boyfriends. Um, he said, tell me a story. Well, I really loved this kid. He had a big round face soft brown skin, <coughs> dark hair that he always would go like this to and he'd push it out of his way. Big eyes that would just like pop. And you know, they kind of soften and they sort of grab you and it was like, okay, I'll do whatever you say. And so I started doing something. Well, my brother had done it, but I'd never done it. I made up a story. And me and Roberto, man, we were like, it was like our eyes kind of went, we were hooked. And then I look around and there were kids all around. They'd stop what they were doing, come a little closer. I found myself surrounded by children, my kids. And I continued telling. You know, and it wasn't so bad. It really wasn't so bad. You know, I always said I hated storytelling, too. I always said, I will never be a storyteller. I'm an actress. That's way cooler. I'm a downtown actress because in the 80s, I was a downtown <laughs> actress working with other downtown people. And there was no way I was going to be a storyteller. But what I found out is whatever I say no to usually slaps me in the face. Whatever I oppose comes right back at me and, and I guess that's what, what it's always going to be. Whatever I don't wish for is what I get. And I've discovered that if I'm really strong about it, there's usually something useful in it. At least seems that way now. I'm still a storyteller. I still teach. I still like kids. Well, actually, I now like kids. Let's put it that way. And I like adults also. It's kind of cool. Be careful what you don't wish for.